We are uh, finishing up Rudolph Bullmond. <clears throat> And I was uh, at the end of the period yesterday trying to communicate <clears throat> the idea that Boltmann rejects all views of the Bible that try to understand it based on some notion of objectivity. So, Jacob, were you here yesterday? No, I mean Monday. It was yesterday it was choir. Were you here Monday? Do you remember that conversation? Can you reconstruct that for us? What, what is at the core of the idea when we say that Boltmann wants to reject all approaches to the Bible based on some idea of objectivity. How would you explain that in normal language? But he said that the Bible was basically mythology and that there is there's the truth, the well if you can say truth, the truth of the Bible isn't any kind of factual or objective truth <coughs> that I don't know if we really explained so far as what he would, how he yeah, would. Yeah, we haven't talked about it. That. Yeah, so the, uh, what I want you to tell me is what does it mean if you are going to approach the Bible with some idea of its objectivity, and you're, that's what you're kind of approaching. What, what would that mean to do if that? You, that would mean that if you're going to approach it with objectivity, wait, are you saying according? Uh, Not according to, well, according to anybody. If, you then know. you would say that there is, that, that, that it is, a book constructed with different genres and it's got uh, historical accounts and poetry and different things and you would try to assess it based upon its historical and literary merit. Maybe. Okay, okay. It would, all of which involves what traditionally is called hermeneutics, the rules of interpreting the Bible. But it all assumes that the Bible has some message that is in the Bible itself. The message doesn't entirely depend on me, right? I did a little experiment in hermeneutics this year. I hadn't thought of it when I taught you guys hermeneutics. Sorry about that. But I showed, them, I showed the kids some art. And I think I showed some Renaissance art and so on. And then I showed um, a Picasso, I think it was. It was something like Picasso anyway which was pretty, um, well, obscure, I think would be the word. And then I said, what does this mean? You know, and it was very interesting. I mean, the kids were very, very resourceful in coming up with what it meant. The one thing I noticed about their view of what it meant was that in about, with about 20 kids in the room, there were about 20 opinions about what it meant. You know, because everybody sort of saw it a little bit differently. And then the question is, well, who's right? And who is right? Jordan, you show a Picasso painting to 20 kids and get 20 opinions as to what it means. Who's right? Well, everyone's right. Everyone's right. Because? Because it's all subjective. It doesn't, my, my thinking of what it is doesn't affect Jacob's name and what it means. That's is. right. Which is simply a way of me saying the painting has no objective meaning, right? It's all somehow meaning I bring to it. All right, well, Boltman wants to say that's the way it is with the Bible. So even the liberals were trying to find an objective meaning for it, and Boltman says, no, the Bible is sort of like modern art. You bring the meaning to it, and you bring the meaning to it by asking the right questions. And the right question he called by the term Vorversonness. Anytime you want to take an idea that's fairly straightforward and make it sound really complicated, then you just throw a German term on it, you know. It's the Vorversonness. Oh, whoa, that guy's deep, you know. Anybody know enough German to, uh, let's see, who was, were you the German guy in here? I yeah. Yeah. No? Actually, you could, if you just think about it, you might be able to figure this one out, even if you're not a German scholar. 
the Vorverstandness. Any ideas what that would be? This is his. Uh, this is what Boltmann says must be possessed by the person who is seeking to interpret the Bible. You have to have a Vorverstandness. Go ahead, Jordan. I was going to say open mind. Oh, that's, um, no, but <laughs> not a bad thought. Not, uh, it's, it, I, it was, it's distantly there, yeah, Alicia? Like, kind of like an imagination. Not quite, but uh, all right. I don't want to play this game too long, but if you, uh, the vor here is like four, like prior. For verstandness would be something like our, under, our our word understanding. So vorverstandness would be the idea of a prior understanding. All right, you have to come with an agenda. We would say, I may have even said it when I taught you guys hermeneutics. I said you need to avoid coming to the Bible with an agenda. I don't know if I said that, but hopefully that's meaningful to you. In other words, coming with some sort of <coughs> stack deck. You know, you bring to the Bible sort of your presuppositions and you find in it that which will support what you've already made up your mind is the truth of the matter. You know, you've got to avoid that. You're supposed to come with what is more the idea of a tabula rasa. You come with a blank slate. You're asking the Bible to speak, not telling it what to say, but hopefully listening to it. That would be traditional biblical understanding. Boltmann says no. You have to come with the right prior understanding, and the right prior understanding is, is formed in terms of asking the right questions. You must read the Bible asking the right questions. And then when the Bible speaks to you in its myth, it will answer those questions for you. The Bible is myth. You know. If I read in the Bible that Jesus rose from the dead, that's myth. If I read even that he preached to the masses, that's probably myth as well. Most of the Bible is myth. But that does not mean that the myth is unimportant. It's very important. But what I have to do is ask myself, how does this myth answer my question? How does the myth of the resurrection of Christ in, his, you know, in, in the story of the Bible answer the question that I'm bringing based on this Vorverstandness? So I don't disregard it. I don't say, oh, that's myth, therefore it's not important. I say, oh, it's myth, it's very important. See? In fact, Boltman would say the most important thing in the Bible is myth. Any little real history that shows up is of negligible importance. Boltman thinks maybe there was a guy once named Jesus. Maybe. But who cares? We don't care. What we care is the myth that was created around this guy and the way it speaks to modern man. Okay, that's kind of the flavor of Bulma. Go ahead. Does he lay out specific, he says they have to come with questions and prior, um, prior understanding, but what, does he lay out what those questions are? Yes. Okay. Yes, excellent question. It's the next point in this highly organized outline that I have right in front of me here. So hang on to that, very good question. And there was someone else question. Same question, and Josiah. What's his view of salvation? Good question. That's, uh, let's see. That's about four points down, so we're getting there too. Okay, good. Good question. I always like it when questions anticipate, you know, what I was actually planning to say. All right, fair enough. Now, the, the reason we're talking about Boltmann after we talk about Heidegger, remember that? Martin Heidegger. is because Boltmann believes that the right prior understanding comes from the philosophy of Martin, Martin Heidegger. But for real. He oh says, God. Martin Heidegger <laughs> has given us that prior understanding, that agenda that we need to bring to the Bible. Martin Heidegger, by the way, a thoroughgoing atheist, was rather bemused by having this Christian theologian on the faculty at Marburg who actually appealed to him as the 
hermeneutical grid by which the Bible should be interpreted. Heidegger thought that was really quite hilarious, you know. And Heidegger was not a very funny guy, actually. So for him to find anything hilarious is somewhat surprising. But he was at least sort of smiled a little bit at this thought. But uh, um, basically what uh, Bultmann believed was that the existentialism, which is formulated in the philosophy of Heidegger, becomes the way or the method by which we can approach the Bible and get from it the meaning that we should get from it. Not the meaning in the Bible, but the meaning we should get from the Bible. Because Heidegger paints the picture of the dilemma of modern man. Let's see. He believes that more than any other philosopher in the 20th century, Heidegger really gets it. You know, in ages past, we've had our delusions of God. We've had this idea that we are created and have a special place in the universe. You know, in ages past, we've had some notion of eternal salvation, heaven and hell and so on, but hey, we're 20th century people, we know better. We know there's no heaven, we know there's no hell, we know Darwin is right, we know we're just the product of these kind of forces of nature and so on. We know better. And so Martin Heidegger is much better than Plato, much better than Aristotle, much better than Thomas Aquinas, much better than all these people who still were working in a universe of imagined deities. You follow me? Finally, Heidegger gets it. We're thrown into existence with no explanation. We have angst. <laughs> right? And what are we going to make out of this? So Heidegger gets it. He sees what a tragic, dark thing it is to be a human being. He gives us the questions. And Boltmann, who is not much more of a theist, I mean, Boltmann has a very, he has, he's not an atheist, but he's not far from it. Boltmann believes that if we have the right questions from Heidegger and we go to the Bible with those questions, the Bible will help us. You know. He calls this the new hermeneutic. Now you may remember, this is so hard to teach to 10th graders, but you guys are now 12th graders. You know, your maturity level is vastly exceeded. Well, I mean with some exceptions, but uh, vastly exceeded. But you may recall, I don't know if you do recall, but uh, there was a chapter in this nice red book. You guys did this, didn't you? Did you guys do this book? No. Oh, you didn't. Oh, then forget it. <laughs> I did. Did you do Sproul? Were you guys? You just gave us a lot of packets, I think. I don't know. Yeah. No textbook? I thought it was Sproul. Ours, yeah, I think. So you guys were the exception. I was so unhappy with this red book that I decided to do something different. And you guys were my experiment. That's right. You did fine. I, I failed, you know. But, uh, I'm back to the red book. I, I still don't like the red book very much. But, but, and Sproul I like better, but Sproul is too thin. It just didn't quite get into some of them. So anyway, uh, so I can't, uh, I can't expect uh, quite the same thing. Anyway, in the red book, he has a whole chapter entitled The New Hermeneutic. And when you try to explain this to 10th graders, their, their eyes glaze over. It's really a sad situation. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there doing CPR on about half of them. You know, come on, come on, come back to life. It's not that bad. It's really, uh, it's really tough. But anyway, uh, you will come across, especially you who do further biblical studies. You go to, you know, Whitworth, Spencer, or something like that. You're going to take Core 150. And, and you're going to come across this stuff. So I'm just, you know, and others of you will have similar experiences. So I just want you to try to remember this and, and have a pigeonhole for it. The new hermeneutic is generally associated with a Boltmannian approach to the scriptures. 
And please get the notion that hermeneutics, hermeneutics, I only teach it, I don't spell it, has at its core a notion that the Bible has an objective content, hence the rules of hermeneutics are intended to help you find that meaning. That's what hermeneutics traditionally has been. How do we figure out what the Bible is saying? We apply the rules of hermeneutics, right? And those rules, explicit, you know, interprets the implicit, the clear interprets the implicit, all of those rules are supposed to help us, guide us to the sense of the text and free me from my own biases. Got it? The new hermeneutic says, no, I need to let my biases be the interpretive mechanism, and that becomes the new hermeneutic singular, a new fundamental principle by which we interpret the Bible, namely that the Bible simply becomes a catalyst for self-understanding. And I get this self-understanding by bringing the questions raised by Heidegger <coughs> to the myths that I find in the Bible, and I demythologize it. And that gives me understanding of my own life and meaning. Go ahead. So did Bolan put forward this idea of the new hermeneutic? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it is now not restricted to Bolan. Okay. So he's the guy that more or less served it up on a silver platter to 20th century biblical scholarship. But at this point, you'll find the idea is much more widely, you know, applied. It's not restricted to Bolman. You have the new hermeneutic applying in a lot of different settings. Now let me just say as a footnote, Bolman is an extremely competent New Testament scholar. And this is where it's a little bit confusing. If you look at Bultmann, for example, and his exegesis of, say, 1 Corinthians 15, you know, Paul dealing with the resurrection, you'll think, wow, this guy really understands the New Testament. He is an extremely competent scholar. He knows exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying, exactly how he's trying to apply it. He knows exactly the argument that Paul is making, and he does an extremely good presentation of the argument. Then he turns around and criticizes Paul like mad for making such an argument, you see. You follow me? He gets it. He knows what Paul is saying. Then he says, now here Paul clearly has fallen into the trap of of uh, sort of a Hellenistic uh, uh, theory of uh, you know the, the death and resurrection and the cycles of life and we can see this in Plato and so on. He says all that after he's very very competently explained what Paul is actually talking about. He's a marvelous scholar. I've referred to him many times personally just to try to understand a text. He gets the New Testament. Doesn't believe a word of it but is really good at understanding it and explaining it. If you, for example, are familiar with, I see you, Jake, if you're familiar with uh, Kittle's theological word book of the New Testament, if you're familiar with that, Kittle, it's one of the most extraordinary scholarly productions of the 20th century dealing with the meanings of Greek words in the New Testament. If you just thumb through, you'll find many of the articles are written by Bullmont, and they're wonderful. He doesn't go into this stuff in those articles. He's just doing pure scholarship. But when you see his theology, then all of a sudden you see, oh, you know, he's got a somewhat different view of things than I thought when I just simply read it. So just be aware of that. Go ahead, Jim. So is there any significant or special significance to the Bible compared to anything else? He thinks, yeah, it's a, that's a great question. I wish I had a better answer than I do. It does seem a little arbitrary, from my point of view, that the Bible would have this fairly high importance to it, when in fact, it becomes, it seems virtually unimportant given his broader 
<coughs> approach to things. You know, why not read the Aeneid the same way? I mean, you know, what, what's so special about the Bible? And I think his answer, and I'm not sure about this, Jacob, so don't, uh, don't plant any flags on this hill, but I just think he believes that for whatever reasons, this book has kind of distinguished itself in some sense or other as being a very meaningful book for people throughout history and that we don't want to discard it. It is, after all, the bestseller of all human history. We don't want to just abandon it, throw it out, but we really do need to appreciate that there's a better way to read it than people have done in the past. I think that's how he'd answer that, but I'm not absolutely sure about that. Yeah. yeah. So like, so would you say you could still be an expert on the Bible? Oh, the yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you get that. This in some ways proves the very point that Boltmann is trying to deny. The Bible does have an objective content, and Boltmann's very good at finding it. You know, you do not need to be a Christian to get the Bible, because it comes in human language, verbs, nouns, the meanings of words are basically there. What the Christian has when he reads the Bible is not so much some lens like the Urim and Thummim of Joseph Smith that gives you special insight into what other words... No, what the Christian has is a positive disposition toward the meaning of the Bible given by the Holy Spirit. So Boltmann reads it, gets it, hates it. You read it, get it, love it. Both of you can read it and get it. You following? I think that's the big difference there. Yeah. Do, does the academic world or like the people who look at Boltmann who aren't Christians, do they consider him a Christian thinker? or? He would be regarded by, I think, generally the outsiders as one of the great enlightened Christian theologians of the 20th century. Yeah. All right. Let me just try in the last five minutes to give you the, the, the heart of, of his, um, what he finds, okay, as you demythologize the Bible. He goes back to the whole question of the kingdom of God. Historically, the kingdom of God is understood as something that takes place in time. It's growing, it's expanding. As Jesus himself said, it starts like a mustard seed and it gradually expands until presumably at some points becomes a dominant force in world history, all right? So there's a kind of classical view of the nature of the kingdom of God. It would be pretty commonly held, not by all, but by many. Boltmann rejects that and says that any idea of the kingdom really working in history needs to be abandoned, needs to be rejected. That the understanding of the kingdom has to be rather seen as something that takes place outside of history and it takes place rather in the moment. So he really likes this notion of a moment, that's a very existential notion, of course, this moment of encounter with that which is ultimately meaningful. You're living along in your life, moment by moment, tick, 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 Kronos is going along, and ever so often there's the kairotic moment, the kairos, the breaking in of the kingdom. And it comes to you in what Boltmann calls the hic et nunc, the here and now. This is the moment, you see, where you have this crisis of encountering some sense of that which is greater than you. And the myths of the Bible help you do that. But you should never try to translate that into some theory of history, some idea of the kingdom in history, or some such thing. It's very, per it's intensely personal. It's you in this confrontation with the great reality of God. But what does he mean by God? He doesn't really mean Yahweh, as we find him in the Bible, a God who splits the Red Sea or any such thing. I think probably. <clears throat> the closest you'd get to his notion of God would be something like Plotinus, 
<clears throat> you know, the one, this kind of unknown, indescribable reality at the core of things, um, very Gnostic. Boltmann, by the way, has been called by many a neo-Gnostic. for reasons I'm not going to bother with right now, but this will be part of it, that his very view of God is kind of this <clears throat> sort of indescribable reality that you encounter in a sort of mystical confrontation. And the myths of the Bible help you do that. You know? It leaves me pretty unenthusiastic, to be honest with you. Wow, if that's the best he's giving me as a guide for my life, it's not very inspiring. So anyways, uh, he's a typical of a lot of what's happening in 20th century theology, 21st century theology. We are going to move, however, from Boltmann to Jean-Paul Sartre, who probably is the most famous existentialist of the 20th century. And we're going to read one of his plays, which I think you'll find most enjoyable. And we're going to start that uh, tomorrow. All right. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Arrivederci.